Hello and welcome. Well, does your little one have eczema or another atopic condition such as hay fever, asthma or allergies? If your answer is yes, then you may want to listen in. Did you know that in Australia, one in three children and over one million Australians have eczema? So if this is you or someone in your family, it's good to know that you are not alone. Eczema, allergies and asthma are three common childhood conditions that are often linked together. And today we're here to discuss eczema awareness with our special guest, Steph Holdsworth from Alishik for Eczema and Allergy. Now, a little bit about our guest. Steph has over 20 years experience as a nurse working in children's ward, um, emergency and infection control. Now, she is an eczema and allergy advocate and educator with big dreams to change the world through her business, Alishik. She's also a spreader of autism awareness and acceptance and a busy mum to uh, how many how many children do you have now, Steph? You've two, got two, little two amazing little people. Thanks for joining us, Steph. How are you? Good. Thank you for having me. Very excited. Well, this is our first chat, and we're very excited to have you a partner here at Kittypedia. Um, and to begin with, you know, in in preparation for this chat today, it's I found it really hard to believe that the stats are so high here in Australia, with one in three children suffering from eczema, which is really incredible. But um, I'd love to know initially if you could maybe just explain to anyone watching and listening what's been your personal experience with with eczema. So I had eczema growing up as a child. I had a very allergic family. So we had all the allergies, the asthma, all that kind of thing. Sometimes genetics plays a part. And um, then when I was working in children's ward, we um, quite often saw the worst of eczema in the hospital. So that is when a flare-up is completely out of control and the child's miserable, it might be infected. And so they've come into a hospital for us to manage it. Yeah. And um, so I knew all the techniques and tricks and things that we'd learned in the hospital. And then when I became pregnant with my daughter, I sought all the best of advice. I saw immunologists, I spoke to the dermatologists, I even saw a naturopath to see, was there anything that I could possibly do to make sure I didn't pass these things on to my daughter? Unfortunately, you just can't fight genetics sometimes. And she ended up with anaphylaxis, allergies, and eczema. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started our journey of trying to heal her eczema. And um, I guess Alashik was born because I knew what I needed. I knew how to treat the eczema, but I couldn't find the products that I needed online. And um, there was only one other place in Australia where you could buy those things at the time. This was 12 years ago, mind you. And um, it was ridiculously expensive. These are products that need to be changed as a child grows. You need to step up. And um, it was just too expensive. It was not sustainable and definitely not for a single income family. Mm. And so that's how Alashik was born. And um, we hit the market. We, I'm proud to say we dropped the prices and the profits of some other businesses, which did not make us very popular. <laughs> um, but yes. That's, that's great. And our... And, um, been our journey. and you've mentioned in your article, which we'll speak about in just a moment, that eczema is usually associated with an, um, other atopic conditions such as hay fever, asthma and allergies. Um, and eczema is often the first of these conditions to appear with 50% of kids who develop eczema developing it within the first 12 months of childhood. Um, food allergies are also common in children, as we know, um, with eczema with 30 to 40 percent of kids with eczema also having food allergies so i'd like love to know um why do some children get eczema and others don't this is actually the a really important message and the cold hard facts of it is we just don't know we know it's an immune fault it's a mm -hmm. response to the immune system and we know that if you look at skin cells under a microscope, normal skin cells sit quite snugly yeah. together, they interlock, and eczema cells actually sit quite far apart. So they allow the skin's moisture to drain out and they allow things to come in. And we know that with allergic children, it's again, an immune response to a normal substance. So the, the immune system is attacking some everyday substance like dust mites or grass or something like that. Right. And the skin right. has a inflammation response to those processes. 
Okay. Um, but we do not know why some children get that and why some children don't. And that's why you will find families where one short child may be affected, but nobody else is in the family. Or um, mum or dad have never had eczema, but their child has eczema and it's not a family condition. We don't understand why. Yes. So um, following on from this, we published your article titled Eczema Awareness. Now, for someone who hasn't yet read the article, can you please give us a little bit of an overview of what it's about and just tell us what inspired you to write it? Well, I found myself constantly saying to my daughter, stop scratching, which is really a benign thing to say because they can't stop scratching that's one of the key characteristics of eczema is it always comes with an itch the chemical release in the rash actually makes it itchy and it's an insatiable kind of itch they can't help it and that's why we see children most often um, that have just shredded themselves overnight so they've scratched until they're bleeding, oh, goodness, the yes. white, red and weepy. And, you know, that's when parents are super distressed and wondering what they can do to stop this. But, yeah, it's not as simple as just stop scratching. Mm-hmm. So this is what the article said is, is about that's, then. Yeah, that's how the, the um, what inspired me to write the article because I was actually sitting at Westmead Children's Hospital Um, with my daughter for an allergy appointment and I heard another mum saying stop scratching just stop it just (laughs) sit on your hands and it's not as easy just not as easy as that and so then we go into some hints and tips of how you can actually um, take the heat out of the itch because the heat is one of the main driving forces um, Mm -hmm. for the itch Mm -hmm. and the inflammation out which then settles down a lot of the other conditions with it. So we'll have a link in the show notes, of course, to anyone that wants to to read the article um, and um, maybe sort of pick up on some of those other tips as well. Um, but initially, I'd love to know also, is there anything that we can actually do to stop children from getting eczema? Is this something that is that, that, we, that we can fix at all? So there's nothing that you can actually do to prevent getting eczema. And this is a really important message because I've seen quite a few damaging articles in Facebook and um, on social media. And I just want to say to poor, tired, desperate mums, um, don't believe everything you first see. If you see a nugget of information on social media and you think, oh, that sounds really interesting, I might follow that up, put it into Safari and see what articles come up. You know, is it just that Facebook article that comes up or is there actually something there to back it up? Because I've seen some really harmful things recently um, about, you know, we can prevent your child from getting with these supplements or with these oils or, you know, around that kind of thing. And it's just, you know, the World Health Organization recognizes no cure and no known prevention. So eczema can't be cured then, is that right? Eczema cannot be cured. That is a scientific fact, but you can outgrow eczema. We know that about a third of children will outgrow childhood eczema. Um, but you can 100% get it under control, which means that from the outside, it may look like you do not have eczema any longer, Um, but it cannot be cured. And that is why um, if you go to see, I hear a lot of frustration from people who say, go to see a dermatologist and they go, the dermatologist will prescribe some cream or a course of treatment And they'll say, I did that and it came back and it didn't work. And they'll go back to the dermatologist and they'll suggest a different course of treatment. And this is why there's there's no one fits all treatment even for eczema. All eczema is different. So some is diet mediated, some is environment mediated, some is just genetics. Mm -hmm. And we don't actually even have a test that can say, yep, yours is from this or yours is from this. So this is where a lot of the frustration lies for families too, I think, is, um, you know, we hold these specialists in such high esteem and we think we've waited six months, sometimes a lot longer to to see these people. Yeah. Yes. And we think finally, yes, I'm going to see him. He's going to cure it. There's going to be a magical treatment and there's, there really isn't, but there are some, um, key things that you can do before like I would like to say to families 
if you're waiting on that long waiting list, waiting for an appointment, yep. one of the most important things you can do is keep a diary. So I say keep a diary of, um, and every day just write a little bit in there of what the weather conditions were. Was it humid? Was it windy? Um, was there a lot of pollen about the, the time of year that it is? Um, where did you go? Did you go to the park that day? Did you stay home all, all day? Did you go to grandma's? You know, where did you go? And then the, just some notes on food. So he had some strawberries. I noticed about two hours later, he was really scratching in his arms or his eyelids became quite red or because we do know some foods can make a flare up worse. Mm -hmm. And if you can have that kind of information before you get to see your dermatologist or immunologist or whichever path you're going down, that can kind of help eliminate a lot of things that they're just going to get you to go off and trial after you've seen them. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing, just taking a step back, when you're talking about some of the other products that people see circulated on the net, um, be it social media or anywhere, for, for a parent um, to, to do their research, what's a, what's a scientific evidence behind that? So it's not just a fad um, and it's not, you know, a lot of the time just to, to do your own research. And the second part of it is that um, I guess for any parent who may think they may have a child with eczema or starting an eczema journey, the first thing they should do is is to start a, a diary and to document day by day the weather conditions and what they're eating. Is that right? Yes. And I think, okay. I think GPs are also overlooked in the treatment of eczema. So really your GP should be your first port of call. GPs have a lot of updated knowledge around eczema um, because they're the first one. They're on the front line. They're the first one and they will be the one that will eventually refer you to where you need to go and what, what you need to do. Um, Mm, okay, great. And um, Allergy and Anaphylaxis Australia state that people who have eczema, which is everything that you've just said before, have a difference in their genetic makeup. So this means that their body uh, does not make up the oils and the fats that are meant to protect the skin. And that's what you, you, you just demonstrated for anyone watching this on a video um, and anyone that's um, listening to this on, on the podcast. It just means that there's not as much moisture to protect it, um, which will increase the irritants entering into the skin. So one of the most common approaches to eczema typically focuses on creams um, and just the skin. Um, but I just wanted to ask, are there other known triggers for eczema that you know of? Dust mite is definitely a big one. So, dust mite, um, yep. Yeah, dust mite can live in. And a misconception with um, dust mite is people see, um, you know, you look through a window, you see dust particles in the air. That's not dust mite. Dust mite are little microscopic creatures that feed off disgustingly our shedded skin and um, things like that. And you are, when you have a reaction to dust mite, you're reacting to their bodies and their secretions. So um, again, I've seen lots of sprays and things like that to get rid of them. That's not going to help because their actual bodies are still there. You might've killed them, but they're the thing that you're reacting to is still there. So dust mite is definitely a big trigger um, for eczema. Mm -hmm. And then weather conditions. Some people do great up in the tropics in the humid weather. Their skin is amazing, never been greater. Other people go out to Broken Hill and in the dry, non-humid conditions, their skin thrives. So again, there's no one. And this is the frustration for most people with eczema is, unfortunately, it is just trial and error. It's mm -hmm. getting to know your skin and what works for you and following what that about, path. What about food triggers as well? There are some well-known, um, we call them itchy foods. So tomatoes is one, strawberries is another common one. Um, but I would say here, it's important not to exclude food groups. So I have seen on a lot of chat groups, oh, I'm going to take my child off dairy to try and cure their eczema mm -hmm. and especially if you are a atopic family or if you don't you don't even know that it's going to happen but if this atopic march of eczema then allergies is going to occur you can actually help develop an allergy by avoiding a whole food group mm -hmm. so as i said before i come from a very allergic family and when my daughter was diagnosed anaphylaxis to eggs we stopped eating eggs. We had, didn't have eggs in the house and I stopped eating eggs. 
And before eggs was not one of my anaphylaxis allergies, but now that I have avoided it, my body hasn't been having it. It doesn't see it regularly. So um, when I did have some egg, I just had some egg in a cake, I think when my daughter was about five, mm -hmm. I actually had an anaphylaxis because my body now sees that as a threat, doesn't understand what it is or what to do with it. And so now I've given myself an egg allergy by avoiding that food. That's really so interesting. It's really, really important not to just go excluding food groups without consulting with an um, immunologist or your local doctor. Mm, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Steph. Is there anything else in particular that we can do to help minim minimise like flare-ups like that as well? Um, in your article, I think you actually you list a few, don't you? Um, I think you the, the, go the with best them. thing that you can do to stop a... Um, or reduce the time of a flare up um, is you need to get the heat out of the rash because when there's heat and inflammation um, it doesn't matter how much cream or what cream you're putting on there if the there's so much inflammation built up the cream can't get down to where it needs to be so one of the first things is you need to get the heat out of the rash which brings the the inflammation and the swelling down so um, what we usually do, and this is what we would do if you came into hospital with severe eczema, is a technique called wet wrapping. Um, so usually the child has a bath um, with some soluble, water-soluble bath oil in there and um, QV bath oil is a great one. There's lots of others on the market. Um, and then it involves, you need to have everything set up before you go to the bath. Um, but then the next... Um, thing in the procedure that we do is we pat down dry don't rub you don't want to be completely dry you need a little bit of moisture left on the skin if you're using steroid steroid first and then a really really thick layer of moisturizing cream so it shouldn't be opaque it should be really thick and white or if you're using a paraffin you should be able to see that thick layer of yellow and then um, we use, a, uh, it's, it's called wet wrapping, but they're not wringing wet. They're just damp garment over the top. And so that held against the skin helps to take the, the inflammation out. It takes the itch out. They don't feel itchy. They don't feel angry and tired and emotional. Um, and it actually allows the cream to get down into those layers where it needs to be to be able to help the skin to start healing. You mentioned another thing um, to, to help minimise flare-ups is wearing 100% cotton or cotton bamboo blended clo clothing as well. Um, and that can help um, avoid, um, I guess, the scratchiness and the, with the fabrics. Is that something else that yeah. you've actually done with your, your kids as well? Yes. Yeah, so um, when we first went to a dermatologist with our daughter, he was um, completely next level about 100% cotton. And my daughter had some tights on that had 4% elastine. And um, you need elastine in tights because otherwise they don't stretch. And then if you wash them at 100% cotton, they don't go back and retain their shape. Um, but he was convinced that that was the whole reason of her eczema and um, insisted that we go off and find 100% cotton clothing. Now we know that if you, um, and that was 12 years ago, a lot of research and things have changed since then. Um, but now we know still um, natural fibres are better. So silk, cotton, bamboo, Wool is a natural fibre, but it's not ideal for eczema. It doesn't allow the skin to breathe and it can be quite itchy. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very easy to be high and mighty and say, you must only use 100% cotton, 100% bamboo. But eczema is such an expensive condition for families to live with. And there really isn't any, uh, a lot of PBS or um, government rebate support for the condition. So I just say to families, do the best that you can, get as close as you can <clears throat> to those kind of fabrics. Mm -hmm. And the um, and some of the other things that you list in the article also um, to help min minimise flare-ups are lukewarm baths or showers, using soap-free products and moisturisers um, to pat dry rather than rubbing the skin um, with bamboo towels after bathing, um, the daily moisturising after bathing and just in general to avoid um, extreme temperature changes as you were just mentioning 
um, being out, outdoors and, and all those types of things as well. Um, there's another thing you mentioned down the bottom that new, new research is showing that the use of prebiotic uh, can also be used for eczema. Can you maybe just expand on this just a little bit more? So there is um, a lot of research at the moment. Um, there was recently a peanut trial conducted by the Murdoch Children's Institute and mm -hmm. they used a, um, there was two trials of prebiotic, one with prebiotic and peanut and one probiotic and peanut. And um, the children that had been anaphylactic to peanuts prior to this trial um, had actually been able to um, ingest and have peanuts safely with the combination of a probiotic. Um, again, disclaimer, you shouldn't just go off and do that. This was under very strict medical guidance. Of course. Um, but there is a lot of emerging evidence too that because we, we know eczema is a, um, an immune fault, that maybe um, a prebiotic or a probiotic, which is um, like fermented foods and foods that help heal the gut may actually be the key to curing eczema. But there are a lot of studies underway about this at the moment. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Is there a, a direct relation between eczema and gut health? As you've just mentioned, and you mentioned, as we've just said in the article, that prebiotics are non-digestible um, food fibres that benefit the body by stimulating the growth of um, healthy bacteria in the intestines. But what else do you know? And or I, I guess can any parent go away and do some research on that, that relation between eczema and gut health then? I think it's going to be a um, very important link. At the moment, there's no solid evidence um, to, to show any positive outcome at the moment. But the fact that in countries where we had very minimal amounts of eczema, like um, a lot of Asian countries, mm -hmm. now they are eating more um, Western foods and living a more Western way of life. We know the eczema rates are soaring in those countries Interesting. where previously they had been quite low. So I think um, following that kind of thinking, um, definitely there's going to be a link there. But again, you can speak to people who are in their 80s who had children with eczema and they will say, um, you know, we didn't have all this pre-packaged food and things that we have now, but we still had eczema. So well, I think it's just going to be another piece of the puzzle. Well, getting back to the environmental triggers, what are some of the common environmental triggers then that say, for example, um, the grandparents or people you just you were just talking about just then um, may have had that we also have now that we need to look out um, and align with um, eczema. Do you think definitely grass seeds? Grass mm -hmm. seeds is definitely a big one, and grass contact. Yep. Um, and pollens is another big one. So mm -hmm. even um, in summer, for my daughter, I know if we're going um, summer is a big time for all the grass seed to come out. Where possible, I put her in light, long cotton pants and um, cotton shirt just to try and stop exposure to the trigger areas. So as children develop, the trigger areas change. So in babies, it's usually um, on their cheeks and in the folds of their arms behind their knees. And then as they get older um, or school aged, it kind of develops more down the leg, more down the arm, disappears a bit more from the face. And then as we go into adults, it kind of reappears on the face and disappears more from those um, childhood areas and comes to the trunk and things like that. So I think um, if you're definitely, if you're in the middle of a flare up, covering those areas when you're going out and um, definitely if you've got toddlers that like to run and play in the grass and that sort of thing, definitely trying to cover them up and limit that exposure mm. is a good thing. Yeah. Great tips. Um, and you've also mentioned that the majority of uh, sufferers, 85% actually, which is a lot, have their first symptoms before the age of five. So um, could you maybe just confirm for us what are some of those common occurrences that a child may experience that would indicate that they may be suffering from eczema? What should parents be looking out for? Sometimes it might just develop as a um, what we used to call a licky rash. So children will get a, a rash where they kind of lick underneath their lip and then that can develop from under there. Under lip? Yeah, under the, under the lip. We call it a licky rash because it's the area where your tongue can... Oh, so inside reach. the mouth? No, no, on the outside of the skin here. Okay. 
just just here it's um any parents that are listening or watching will definitely know um, what I'm talking about with a licky rash and sometimes a barrier cream can be enough to stop that so you're stopping the food once the rash is developed you're stopping food or anything even saliva can aggravate that mm -hmm. um, so just a barrier nappy cream anything like that can help that sort of thing um, but then the cheeks is another common area for babies um, they get the dry exposed cheeks and then the folds of the arm for babies and usually behind the, the back of the legs or the, the trunk. Legs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in your view, why is it important to have, um, you know, any child's skin rash correctly diagnosed by a healthcare professional then? I think it's really, really important not to Google doctor these things because um, it's very easy to um, misdiagnose. Right. Um, and, there are a few conditions that are very closely aligned. So eczema and psoriasis might look the same to you, but if you go see a healthcare professional, they'll be able to say to you, no, we're dealing with this. No, we're dealing with that. Um, and I think it's important to get on top of these things early. Um, I think, like I said, the first port of call should probably be your GP. If, it, if, you, if it's a baby, then your child health nurse, you can even speak to them when you go to your clinics for your um, child health appointments and they can definitely um, put you onto the right people. But I think the most important thing in management is to get on top of it with the right professional, the right treatment early. <laughs> um, don't, because you, can spend, you could spend a small fortune um, in... Facebook um, support groups say, and oh, this cream worked for me, and this, you know, I went on the cell reduced diet, I did this, I did that. And those things may work for some other people, but you could just be spending all your hard earned dollars on nothing. So, um, after seeing the GP, there's a whole list of different healthcare professionals that parents can see, being dermatologists, allergists. Um, could you maybe just quickly just run through each one of them just and just briefly just describe the difference between each one so parents, um, I guess, can just, just understand and or um, another question, sorry, just throwing so many questions at you, but <laughs> you, will your GP tell you which um, healthcare professional to see or is that on the choice of the parent af after seeing their GP? That can be on the choice of the parent. You can always ask your GP for a, for a referral to mm -hmm. a, um, and I have heard of people saying, oh, I asked my GP for a referral to an immunologist and he said, no, no, that's not necessary. You can actually insist um, and if not, you can seek a, another opinion if you believe that your child is developing an allergy or something that needs more closer monitoring. Um, but after your GP, um, the next port of call is either a paediatrician, who a paediatrician is really a link between your GP and your specialists. Mm -hmm. If you need to go that far, most paediatricians are very good at managing basic eczema without any involvement in um, asthma or immunological conditions. Mm -hmm. um, another port of call may be a dermatologist. So a dermatologist, yep. as it says in the name, just deals with the skin. Yes. Um, so they may do um, skin prick testing, which is some testing to see what's flaring your eczema. They may not. That's more an allergy thing, which brings us to our next, which is the immunologist. Mm -hmm. And an immunologist looks at the whole immune system. So for a lot of people, they're the better choice because they're not just treating the eczema, they're looking, okay, we've got eczema, but is there an underlying allergy that's causing the eczema to flare? Or is there another immune condition which is actually causing the eczema to flare? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then there's an allergist, which is basically the same as an immunologist, just a different qualification. Great. Thank you for um, just explaining all of those. Um, okay, I'd also, it's very confusing. Yeah, well, that's just the thing and, and, and understanding what's best for the child. And, and would any one child possibly see all four different types of doctors after a GP or would you own, typically only see one? Um, yep. So my daughter, when um, she was quite young, she um, started with the dermatologist. Um, we then progressed after she had an anaphylaxis to the immunologist 
Um, in our case, and I stress this is our case, um, our immunologist said, I won't agree with the treatments that the dermatologist has to say because I'm treating the whole immune system. He's just treating the skin. The so skin. Yes. Um, at the time, our immunologist suggested that we should choose which path we wanted to go down. So we chose the immunology. Um, and we, of course, have a paediatrician as well because our um, same, I'm sure it's the same across Australia. To get into an immunologist is a massive wait unless you've had an anaphylaxis or a, a um, acute condition that has brought you before that kind of specialist. Um, and so your paediatrician is sort of your guide in that period in between. So they manage um, the suggestions and the treatment of the, the immunologist. And um, definitely if you're going to end up in your local hospital or anything like that, that will be your paediatrician, that will be your touch point there. And they're also a liaison between the GP as well. So mm -hmm. an immunologist may prescribe a treatment for you. The paediatrician can help manage it. But then also um, paediatricians can be hard to get into. So if you just need a script re, um, repeat mm -hmm. or um, if you are, have started a treatment and you've had a flare-up or you think your child's having a reaction to what's being prescribed, then you, the first person you will go to will be back to the GP. And then the GP will pass it back up the line. Because That's in great. Australia, it's not as easy as just walk in and see your immunologist whenever you yes. think these things are happening. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, I'd also love to know what your thoughts are about steroid creams, you know, and what have you found, I guess, over the years, uh, the common misconceptions about them? So I believe that steroid creams do have a place in um, treating eczema. There is a lot of controversy around steroid creams. Um, there is suggestion that it can thin your skin, which yes, would I've be read that. a very extreme case. Um, I was using, when, as I was a child, because we didn't know any better then, I was using some very heavy cortisone creams and I can 100% guarantee you I have no thinning of my skin. Um, and usually these days with steroids, we pair right back. So we start with a very low dose. Sometimes it might be even be 0.01 of a percent. And then we work up if that's not working. So you really shouldn't be afraid to use the steroid cream if a doctor has prescribed it for you. Um, but when used effectively, um, it's not an ongoing thing. You use it during a flare up to get that flare up under control, definitely in with a wet dressing is the, is the best way to use it. And then you shouldn't need it. You should be able to go back to just moisturizing cream and then just use it sparingly during a flare up. But also with a steroid, you don't smear it all over the skin. You're just using it in those flare up areas too. Okay. Um, so steroid creams are only used sparingly only in just sparingly. the areas. Okay. Just the areas that are flaring up. Okay. Yep. So there is definitely a condition called um, atopic steroid withdrawal, which is where someone has been exposed to a lot of steroids and then their skin actually goes through a different rash process from withdrawing from the use of steroid. But that is not a very common condition and definitely not in children. So um, I know a lot of parents try to go the, the natural route, especially when it comes to putting things on their baby. Um, but um, steroids definitely have a place to pay in, in eczema management and actually um, anaphylaxis and allergy Australia and the World Health Organization have now um, made a statement that it's best to not use food items in a cream when treating eczema um, so coconut oil things like that which are very popular for natural alternatives try and stay away from those when Okay, great. It's good to know. Are there any other treatment creams you can recommend a parent try? And I guess the question is, how effective are they in general? I think the, the most effective thing to do is wet wrapping. So, um, and for that, the kind of creams that we use are um, like paraffin, really thick, heavy emollients, which is going to really get the moisture back into the skin you really need an intensive moisture session too that's why we use the soluble bath oil first 
um, no longer than 10 minutes because after then the skin barrier actually starts breaking down um, for an extra hydration point and then straight into wet wrapping with that. So um, Epiderm is a really good brand. I would steer away from things like Sorbeline. That's kind of old school thinking. Um, it's full of a lot of petrochemicals that are actually quite, um, and it did the old version did have alcohol in it, which is actually Even not worse. helping your skin. Yeah. Yep. Going to dry um, it out. But yeah. there are literally, it's a multi-million dollar business, Exma. There are millions of cream. Like if you go down to the chemist and look at the shelf, there is so many creams, so many options. So, so what I'm hearing that ex, ex, eczema treatment, sorry, are as individual as um, the child and can vary. So while something, for example, like goat's milk, which I've seen can treat eczema or oatmeal products might work for, for one child, it may actually inflame the condition in another child. So it's about, so is it, is it trial and error to just to find what works best um, for your child then? This is definitely the most frustrating thing of eczema and it is trial and error. So um, as you just stated, I could use an oatmeal bath and it might be amazing for me. You could use it and break out in hives or it could make your rash worse. Um, that's why we suggest trying these cheaper things first, like oats in a stocking is a pretty cheap kind of thing to, to try um, before you know, investing big money in treatments because um yeah i've go to any eczema support page and you will see you know if somebody says looking for the best cream for my baby and i am not even joking when i say there will be at least 200 comments under there and probably 90 percent of them will all be a different treatment there's no one this was amazing this was my go-to this is the Poor, poor creams, another great Because no situation and no child is ever going to be the same in, in the same no. case scenario. So it's about finding what works best for you then. Yep. And yeah. that's the most frustrating thing about eczema is there is, which is why there's no known cure or else all doctors would be able to say to you, yes, go and get this cream and you'll be rid of it. Mm -hmm. Steph, this has been a really great chat. Um, we've covered off a lot of information. If you were to summarize your key messages for any parent watching or listening, what would they be? I'd say you're not alone. You're definitely not alone. It feels like it when your child is screaming and miserable and not sleeping because they just want to tear themselves to shreds. But start with your GP um, and get a good you know, understanding of how to treat the eczema. Even some local hospitals have eczema clinics that you can go to. Um, don't leave it too long. If, you, if your child's eczema is really red and angry, if it's weeping, if there are crusting sores or if there's yellow pustules, anything like that, go to your local hospital. Um, I know lots of people think, oh, I don't think this is hospital worthy, but it really is. Um, an infection in the skin can quite easily transfer to the blood barrier and become very serious. So if in doubt, go to your local ED. Um, they will at very least be able to um, give you some guidance. Um, but just know that there is no known cure and please don't buy into um, social media, I guess. Um, one size fits all and or it, there yeah, is one thing kind of cures. It. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And if you see something that's too good to be true, it probably is. So don't just go off, you know, we've all been there two in the morning scrolling through our social media and you see the jazzy post of somebody who struggled and look at my child's before and after and buy this product. But get out of the social media, get onto Safari, get onto Google, have a look, research a little research. bit more. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Don't just believe the hype of the... 2am tired mum post. Yeah. <laughs> Steph, this has been great. If parents have got any other questions for you and or want to reach out to you after this chat, whereabouts can they find you? Um, they can find me at Alice Sheik. So www.alicechic.com.au and we'll pop that I'm sure in the, the show notes down there. And I'm happy to answer any questions um, or otherwise if people are wondering what wet dressing is that we keep talking about through here, there's a, a video on YouTube of that walks you through how to do it. Um, and you can do that at home right now and start getting relief. Thanks, Steph. Take care and really look forward to chatting with you soon. <laughs> if I can get my words out, take care. <laughs> See ya. Thanks for having me. See you. Uh, bye. <laughs>